Hi, I'm Jim Zogby, and welcome to Viewpoint. Tonight, uh, I'm going to talk with Hussein Hassouna. He's the chief representative of the Arab League to the U.S. about his work at the League and its current role in sending peace monitors to Syria. Then we'll look at this year's top wackiest congressional actions in the Middle East. It's a list compiled by Lara Friedman of Americans for Peace Now. But first, the Arab Spring. It turns uh, one this month, and with a reflection on what it's accomplished and where it is today and where we can expect it to go in, as we go into the new year, I want to welcome Rob Malley. He's Program Director for the Middle East and North Africa at the International Crisis Group. He served as Special Assistant to the President for Arab-Israeli Affairs during the Clinton administration and as Director of Democracy and Human Rights and Humanitarian Affairs at the National Security Council. Rob, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a year later. There was a lot of romance in the beginning, um, and, uh, but things have settled in uh, a bit. I want to take a look, if we can, sort of, uh, not, not quite a round robin, but I want to go around the, the, the region and take a look at what's happened, um, what didn't happen, and where we can expect things to go. But first, I just want to talk about an article you wrote, f specifically focused on Egypt. <clears throat> my, my question is going to be focused on Egypt, but an article you wrote in the New York Review of Books. With and, Hussein Aga. Is that that with Hussein Aga, yeah. And it, in, in it, you begin making a, a comment about how the revolution in Egypt turned Lenin on its head, on his head, because Lenin said that for a revolution, uh, to take place, there has to be an organized party and a co coherent philosophy, and a, et cetera. Um, and I would argue that it was precisely because of the absence of all of those mm -hmm. that what happened in Egypt wasn't a revolution. It was a rebellion, an upheaval of some sort. But then when things settled down, they pretty much settled back to where they were in the beginning. And that's the, sort of the undoing of it. Just re reflect yeah, on that I mean, if you I would. I think you know, what we say in the, in the piece and what I've been thinking is that those are the strengths of whatever we want to call it. You could call it the revolution. In the article, we say it was a revolution which ended basically the day that Mubarak was deposed because then there was the comeback of some of the counter-revolutionary yeah. forces. But more fundamentally, those who were sort of at the head of what happened in Tahrir Square were not the ones who picked up the spoils of what happened. The liberal Democrats, some, some of those who are more Western inclined, are not the ones we see today being elected to parliament, and they're not the ones who sort of set the tone for what was happening in Egypt once Mubarak was no longer uh, at the head of the country. And I think that's the point you're making, is because they didn't have a leadership, because they didn't have a program, because they didn't have a party, they were in some ways able to overcome the resistance of Mubarak, uh, that Mubarak put because you really couldn't hit them. They were sort of amorphous, and it was very hard. They didn't know how to deal with them. But once they triumphed, in fact, was the, the, the pinnacle of their success. And after that, uh, we saw others, whether it's the military or the Islamists or other forces, that truly uh, took advantage of the situation. So uh, to go back to the Marxist language, the society that was waiting to be born, mm -hmm. that the violence of the, or the upheaval of the revolution ultimately pro, you know, provided the, the midwife role to bring in, pretty much turned out to be the, the situation that already was. Well, the, yes the and the no. Muslim I mean, Brotherhood. I, well, that, that's what I want right. to get at you. What did change? Uh, what has changed uh, in, in Egypt after Mubarak's departure and where we are today? You know, as some have argued, the deep state hasn't changed, and the security forces, the apparatus, the bureaucracy is still there. What's new is that you have this new element, whatever you want to call it, some people want to call it public opinion, the popular will, it's expressing itself in ways that it couldn't express itself before, and the most obvious manifest translation is what happened in the elections, where the Muslim Brotherhood <laughs> and the Salafist parties have, have, have won almost beyond what anyone had expected, 70% of the vote. And the young revolutionaries frustrated have gone back to Tahrir Square and are now being portrayed by the, the military as uh, counter-revolutionaries mm -hmm. uh, and, and as obstacles to stability. And, and are, they're succeeding to some degree in turning the public against them. I mean, two things. I was in Egypt a couple of weeks ago. Two things struck me. One is that, that you know, I think there's a lot of anger at the SCAF among many who feel like the SCAF, the military, is still trying to sort of hijack what happened. But there's also anger at the, some of the people who are still on Tahrir Square. There's just anger. I felt a, a, a nation that is very angry, that is frustrated, because not particularly happy with its condition right now. And I think it's true. We, we tend here in the West, I'm sure you don't, but in the West, a lot of people looked at the TV screens, saw thousands, tens of thousands, sometimes even more on Tahrir Square, 
But they could fuse that with some of the other forces in the country, and I felt that too. People who didn't identify with them, they were pretty, some of them may be happy that Mubarak is gone. But the other, the other thing I, I, I picked up when I was there is some of those revolutionaries are really nostalgic for the days in January a year ago, mm -hmm. when, which was an, almost an apolitical revolution. As you were saying, people who could transcend <coughs> their differences, come to Tahrir Square, demonstrate without politics, without the bargaining, without having to make compromises. But in some ways, Egypt has moved beyond that, and now we are back or in the time of hard politics, where bargains have to be made, compromise have to be made, where there's infighting between the SCAF, the Muslim Brotherhood, and others. And the people who led the revolution at the beginning are not truly equipped right now to play that game. Let's go to Libya. Um, I remember the, I've quoted it many times because it impressed me to such a great degree the, at the time the Brazilian ambassador to the UN when she voted against the, the resolution. She said it will change the narrative of, of Arab Spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and it did. I mean, bringing NATO forces into the mix changed the character of, of what was happening, which had been a, a, a people's movement from the bottom. And yes, it was a, uh, intended as a humanitarian mission, but it, it became something else. Mm -hmm. uh, it became a regime change under the guise of being humanitarian. And, and where are we today uh, in, in, in Libya? It, it, I mean, we haven't talked about Tunisia, but, but Egypt is still in, the, in, in a sort of an unformed gestational state. We don't know where it's going to go. But where's Libya? Well, first, just on, on your point about going back, I was very <laughs> conflicted about, you know, obviously saving lives is something that, uh, that, that and, and if the NATO intervention did that, then that's to be welcomed. I'm not so sure it changed the narrative of the Arab Spring. I think the Arab Spring narrative was going to change no matter what. I mean, look at what happened in Yemen. Look at what happened, is happening in Syria. That has very little to do with what was happening in Tunisia a year ago. Mm -hmm. I think the, ma the major harm of the NATO intervention is what it's done to those, the argument it's provided for those who want to resist the notion of a responsibility to protect, the notion that the international community has a role to play. Because from the inception, it was clear, even though there was a humanitarian impulse, I, I, I don't dispute that, but very clearly, from the very beginning, this was used as a regime change enterprise as much, and at some point even more so, than a civilian protection enterprise. And I think that's made it much more difficult now to argue for any kind of international intervention, whether it's in Syria or elsewhere. And as the record of what's happened in Libya comes out more clearly and more publicly, I think it's going to make it that much easier for those who, for whatever reason, don't want to see international intervention to see to say, you see, this is what it leads to. Under cover of a humanitarian mission, you're actually trying to change the regime. The other problem with it is that it, 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 it provided the necessary force to create the regime change, and who the inheritors of that may not have been ready for prime time. Um, I mean, well, and that, that brings us to your second question about where Libya is today. Yeah. I mean, the Crisis Group, we just published a report about the, what we see as the major problem, which is this proliferation of militias. <coughs> Again, it was something that during the time of the uprising, people felt, you know, whether it's the Gutteries or, the, or some Western powers or others who said, these are the instruments that are going to help us accelerate the demise of Gaddafi's regime. But it's also the instruments that Libya has inherited. It's the, 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 the actors that Libya has inherited, 100, 200, perhaps 300 militias, very hard once they've acquired certain prerogatives, certain privileges, they feel that they're entitled to something, to tell them, sorry, now it's a new Libya, give away your weapons, give away the positions and the perks and the privileges that you've acquired, we're going back to something different. I think you're seeing in Libya sort of the very difficult, the difficulty of disarmament, demobilization of people who have found, who believe that they now are owed something because of the role they played in overthrowing the regime. Let's go to Syria, um, because there are those especially here in America, in, uh, in, in, in some of the Republican Party, who want uh, the U.S. to do in Syria what right. was done in Libya. Um, and there's that same kind of uh, uh, series of questions, I think, that need to be asked about who one would be fighting for and what is the structure of governance that would replace whatever occurs. What, tell me about where Syri Syria is at, at this point and um, uh, the opposition and its readiness to assume a, 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 a role should they inherit the state. And there's a point <coughs> we make in the article with, with Hussein Aga, which is to say that the Arab uprising at the time, which was almost uh, what well, was last September, had three dimensions. And I think we see those three dimensions in Syria very clearly. The first is 
a regime against its people. And the regime is using, using the most brutal means. I mean, truly, and we have, uh, you know, we have eyewitness accounts of, of, of what's happened and how the regime <coughs> in many ways is no longer even a regime. It's become a, a militia that is fighting with very brutal means uh, a, a, a population. That's dimension number one, which is the one that we're focused on for good reason. But there are two other ones. One is sort of what's happening within society, the, the, what, the, the, the fact that the opposition itself is increasingly armed and is at times using violence against security forces and others, and that's a second dimension of sort of people against people, the first being regime against people, the second people against people. And the third, which in Syria I think is maybe the most dangerous, is regimes against regime, sort of this regional international cold war, now hot war, with the attempt being to overthrow uh, uh, Assad's regime, crippling Iran, crippling Hezbollah, and ob obviously the, the, the other side of the, of the coin is Iran and Hezbollah and the Syrian regime doing everything they can to prevent that. And I think there's that risk of the spillover, not just into Lebanon, but elsewhere, Iraq, uh, perhaps uh, the Palestinian field, because so much is at stake, the balance of power between what used to be called the axis of moderation and the, and the militant axis. And that's why the Syrian case has, has become extremely dangerous and, and could very quickly uh, be out of control, not just because of the internal violence, a regime that seems more determined than ever to preserve what it can, even at the cost of the country, of the stability, the, 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 everything that the country has been, and at the cost of stability in the has region. It, has it reached the tipping point? Tipping point towards <coughs> what, I think, is the question. It's certainly, we're now in a phase, I don't know if you want to call it Tipping civil. point in terms of regional leg legitimacy, yes. I, I, I yes. think that they'd have a difficult time getting it back. The question is, um, can, they go can they govern? Can they, can they emerge from this um, in any way, or is the rhetoric of, this, uh, of the Obama administration right, and that is that they've lost sufficient I think very hard. legitimacy that I, yeah, they can't govern. I think it's very hard to see them governing again, at least in any way resembling what they used to do. I think they, could, they may be able to rule, who knows for how long, but they may be able to rule because you know, brute force and, 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 and fear are forces that, and, and the fact that they still have the overwhelming military superiority on the ground, despite the fact that the opposition, the, 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 the armed force, the, whatever the, uh, the, the, the Free the, Syrian, the Free Army. Syrian Army being more militarized, they still are no competition, obviously, for the, for the Syrian security forces. So they could still rule, perhaps for some time, can they govern in any way that will be perceived as legitimate by their own people or by the region or by the international community? I think that's in very serious doubt. When you've gone this far, I don't know how you come back and, and regain the trust of your people. Two other places that you mention uh, have become the surrogate wars. Bahrain right. and, and, and Yemen. Um, let's start with Bahrain and then go to Yemen. Um, there was this report that was done. Um, Sharif Basuni, uh, I, someone I've respected, his work right. I think has been very substantial. Uh, I have not seen the report. I don't know if, if, if the crisis group has evaluated it. Yes. Um, and it's an extremely credible, extremely professional report, really an admirable piece of work. Uh, then, then the question is, it was to be, um, the administration here had put a requirement that it be mm -hmm. a adhered to uh, before weapon sales would take place, et cetera. Uh, t talk a little about how the Bahraini government has responded to that. Uh, is there a reform process? Is there a dialogue process? Is there change afoot? Or, or simply has this not honestly? Uh, there doesn't seem to be any. It doesn't seem to be any of the above. Not by it. And it's not uh, the report's fault, and it's not Sheriff Basuni's fault. He did what he had to do. But the, the regime in, uh, the, in Bahrain is not living up to what it said it would do. And I think it does expose, again, that third dimension of the Arab Spring, which is this regional international competition. And the fact is, in Bahrain, we don't see the Western powers sort of crying foul and saying the regime has to go because it's lost legitimacy and, or accusing it of using the kind of force that it's using and the kind of discrimination against Shiites, which is, which is documented very extensively in, in the report and, and in the work that we've done and others have done. Uh, and you see, and, you know, Saudi Arabia and others, which are calling for democracy in Syria, obviously won't do anything to bring it about in Bahrain or in their own country. So I think it's that dimension which is really polluting sort of the, the, the pristine image of the Arab Spring because power politics are in play now. The double standards, hypocrisy clearly are at play. And I think it does undermine, this undermines the narrative of the Arab Spring even more so than whatever NATO did in Libya. Yemen. Yeah, um, a conflict within conflicts, and one that predated Arab Spring in many ways. Um, and the youth revolutionaries who uh, sort of gave a new impetus to this, 
um, like in Egypt, one could say have been sidelined by events. Yeah. Um, uh, right now, what we're waiting to see in Yemen is whether or not President Saleh, uh, who reminds me of that Seinfeld episode where George Costanza gets fired but keeps coming back to work and sitting at the table. I mean, he agreed to step down. He comes back and in announcing agreeing to step down, he made a number of presidential yeah. declarations and continued to do it. Is, is, he, is, 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 is there a resolution underway or is he buying time? And what's this bit about him coming to the United States? Well, I think you put your finger on one of the themes I think that we're seeing, which is how these popular uprisings then become sort of inter-elite competition, certainly in the case of Yemen, and that's why the protesters are still protesting. They feel like their revolution is being hijacked by one f strand of the ruling elite uh, against another, and that's not what this was about, for them at least. So I think that's one of the themes. The other one, which I think is a general uh, issue that we, you know, we have to just confront, the issue of immunity for, for President Saleh and whether he should be able to come here and perhaps escape prosecution. The deal in Yemen the, 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 by the Gulf Cooperation Council was that President Saleh and his family would enjoy immunity. <coughs> That's what the protesters can't accept. On the other hand, if that had not been part of the deal, he probably would not have res resigned. He would still be fighting uh, in office. And we may have that problem coming up tomorrow in Syria elsewhere. And it's, 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 it's a genuine difficult dilemma. Do you offer immunity for people who may have committed gross crimes? Or do you not, even if that means that you can't resolve the crisis? In Yemen, it's, it's not resolved yet. You don't know what the, tra one doesn't know what the transition is going to be like. There still is competition among the elite and now between Salah and the protesters who are not prepared to accept that he escaped justice. Let me tell callers, if you want to get in the conversation, uh, give us a call. If you're calling from overseas, the number is 001-202-420-5665. From here in the U.S., it's 1-202-420-5730. Uh, lest I exclude Tunisia, I want to go back to Tunisia, which seems the one place where um, significant uh, progress seems to be being made. Right. Um, and and uh, partly it's because I think it's a small country where there's not that much at stake, so the, the, you don't have as much outside interference. It was the first one. It happened relatively quickly. There's a vibrant uh, civil society. And I think you have to, I mean, it's a point, people could bemoan what's happening in Egypt or not. The fact that you have Islamist parties that are taking a, a clear political path, Nahda in Tunisia, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt, we'll see others. I think that is something certainly that is uh, to be to some degree welcomed. You know, people again may not want them to, some people may not want to see them succeed to the extent they are, but they are a legitimate component and a very powerful component of all these societies. The fact that they're going to be able to govern is, is in my view, something that is natural and better that than repressing them and having them develop uh, sort of antipathy towards the political system. So talk about the coming year. Um, what, what, what can we expect uh, in, in, as this unfolds? <clears throat> Will it, um, as they say, go south? Uh, or are there positive signs to look for? Uh, I mean, since everything was unexpected, I'm not going to try to, 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 to uh, prophesize what's going to happen next. I would say this, and I was discussing it with one of my colleagues the other day. People look at 2011 and say, my goodness, we've never seen such activity in the Arab world. This has been a year of, of traumatic, sometimes great, sometimes less great developments. But if you think that 2011 was a hot year where a lot happened, fasten your seatbelts. I think 2012 nothing has been resolved and you're going to see Syria probably become not just more engulfed in violence but spreading out spilling over violence to other places Lebanon I think could be very uh, could be a victim of that because of the sectarian uh, polarization that you and I have spoken about many times in the past Egypt is a society that is fraught with unresolved issues and issues that, they, that their population haven't even confronted that are going to come to the fore so case after case I think we might see we're, we're liable to see much worse in terms of Tra trauma and violence than we've seen. And all that, I haven't spoken about two big issues, the two elephants in the room, Iran, where one might see an Israeli strike against uh, nuclear facilities, and the Palestinian case, where the complete impasse in the peace process could lead to developments in any number of directions, including uh, uh, new, new unrest. So I think 2000, 2011 was sort of the scene setter, as, as a colleague of mine was now, saying the other day, in 2012 will be a year where, where now the actors are in place the real fight will begin. Now, when I was speaking about not ready for prime time uh, with other elements in the region, <clears throat> the question about the United States, mm -hmm. and it's not a question of ready for prime time, but, but 
the U.S. political system <laughs> seems ill-equipped to handle this dramatic change. I mean, just listening to the Republican debate. Well, particularly in an election year, yeah, yes. It, it, uh, uh, it, it's as if folks didn't learn lessons from the failed past and, and want to, uh, you know, to, to repeat some of the mistakes, the, not mistakes, but the, the, the horrific blunders that got us into this hole. And, and I think that the president seems aware of the fact that there's limits that you know, exist right now to what America can or, or can't do. Um, and is, you know, some are chafing with those limits, but the limits are real. Uh, we, the, the term was coined lead from behind, yeah. if we lead at all. But we're, we're almost, in almost every instance, caught in a reactive mode, aren't we? I, it's, it's very easy, I think, <laughs> to sort of criticize and to look at the U.S. and say that they've sort of lost, we've lost influence, we've lost allies, we've lost uh, trust. And I think all that is true. What I, I would also say that it's not clear that there was much that the Obama administration could have done to lead to a very different outcome. They were caught in very difficult dilemmas in the case of Mubarak. Do you side with somebody who's been a loyal <coughs> ally? I mean, let's not, let's not, I mean, it always bothers me when I see any official <coughs> saying, yes, we're happy that Mubarak left, this is what we've wanted all along. Well, you know, nobody's a fool and nobody, everyone knows that the U.S. has been a loyal supporter of Mubarak and vice versa for 30 years. So that, the, the dilemma was either you drop him and you look like you're a hypocrite or you stick with him and you go against the tide of public opinion. And that problem is not just in the case of Egypt, but it was starkest there. I think it's almost a no-win situation for the administration. They could just hope that these, that these processes end up in the best possible place for their interests and for the interests of, of, uh, of others. But it's, there's not much, I think, that the U.S. can do. It has to do no harm. It has to avoid mistakes. It shouldn't assume that it should make pronouncements every day about developments in all these countries, again, because of lack of credibility and lack, lack of influence. We're having some trouble with phones, and so we're not getting calls through. Uh, 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 just one question before I let you go, and that's about Iraq. Um, we talked about it on the show last week. Uh, Prime Minister Maliki was here. Uh, no sooner does he go back than mm -hmm. uh, there's a, uh, a warrant issued for the arrest of a vice president, and uh, one of his deputies uh, pronounces him more uh, more oppressive, I think the word than was, than, uh, than Saddam Hussein. Um, is is this ready to unravel? You know, I don't know if it's ready to unravel, but in my list of what could happen in 2012, clearly I, I left Iraq off, but that's, that should be a sort of a, one of the prime cases where we need to worry. You have a combination of factors. You have the unresolved issues of, of, of Iraq and the polarization between communities there that has not been resolved since 2003. But added to that, two aggravating factors. The U.S. withdrawal, which removes sort of a and I was against the war, and I wish it had never taken place, but once, once what happened happened, the U.S. served as a kind of glue to make sure that people didn't go too far. We see what happens when the U.S. left, and people now fear for the future, so they take action. And what's happening in Syria, which is viewed by Maliki as a threat. If a Sunni regime takes power in Syria, he feels that he is lost and he is more surrounded than he was before. His opponents, his foes, both in Iraq and in the region are emboldened. So you make that you have that combination of the unresolved issues, the American withdrawal, and polarization in the region. Of course, it goes with that. Uh, what's happening in Syria, Iran being more fearful about what might happen in Syria, and therefore trying to increase its influence in in, in Iraq. All of that makes for a very very uh, um, perilous brew. Let me go to UK for a call. Uh, j just one thing: the, the interesting thing about Assad, about Maliki in Syria, was just a few years back. That's right. Syria was the arch enemy that was yeah. uh, provoking but terrorism. But at this point, strategic issues are taking. Uh, Let's go to UK point. for a call right now, caller. We got you through. Hello. Yes. Hello. Yes. Your question. My question about is uh, the negative role Zionist state could have played in the Middle East uh, could have led to worsening the economic and political situation in Egypt by causing arm race in the region in the account of neglecting the economic development of Egyptian population mm -hmm. reached to nearly now 80 million. Thank you very much. Couldn't really hear. So and, and, and the, the unaddressed issue here is the economic situation, which is actually worsened as a result of this. If, if economics was in part behind the unrest, the um, unrest has made things worse. Yeah, inevitably. I mean, that was so visible when I was in Egypt. I mean, the, the, I went to the airport completely empty, the tourist sites completely empty, and I think that explains part of what I saw on the street, which is this 
frustration and anger which could sort of erupt at any second because people don't see a future. And, it's, you know, the challenge in Egypt is going to be the greatest of all because of the, it, it, it almost seems beyond the capacity, not just of the SCAF, but of anyone that may take power to address the very, very deep economic problems they have. And as you say, it's one of the paradoxes of the Arab uprising, fueled in part by uh, material deprivation and frustration, but which also aggravates that frustration. Thanks for joining us, Rob Malley. Thanks for having me. When we come back, I'll talk to the Arab League's chief representative here in the U.S. Uh, about his time in the U.S., and we'll take some more calls. If we can get them through, stay tuned. <laughs>